In January 2018, we toured southern India in a brand new Toyota Innova with our driver Ashok. The first leg of the journey is the coast route from Chennai to Puducherry. We checked into our hotel in Chennai and went straight to Fort St George, where in 1639 the British East India Company built the first fort in the country. It's now the seat of government of the state of Tamil Nadu. Within the fort is St Mary's Church, the oldest Anglican church in Asia. These are the graves of the British officers who died very young, often as a result of disease. Very near to the fort are fairly new apartment blocks built for the local fishermen. Whilst the men catch the fish and tend the nets, their wives sell the catch at the side of the road. I don't need uh, the ice gear. In another part of the city is the fruit and vegetable market. Many Indians are vegetarian and you can understand why when you see the quality of the produce. They sell flowers here as well. This man was preparing banana leaves for use as plates. This saves washing up and they can be composted or just thrown out for the passing cows. We fancied a coffee so we went to the local coffee stand. Here the lady showed us how it was prepared. Pouring it backwards and forwards between containers is designed to cool the coffee down. I thought I'd better learn how to do it, seeing as we'd just bought some ground coffee to take home. I need to work on the height. We've always had bananas for our lunch in India, but the choice here was bewildering. These garlands are being made for temple offerings. Another stall was selling a variety of other offerings to be presented at the Kapaliswara temple just down the street. It's a beautiful temple, but photography isn't allowed inside. The next day we braved the city traffic and followed the ultra deluxe coach down the coast road. We saw several nurseries at the side of the road and our guide offered to take us round one. This happened to specialise in medicinal plants and the owner gave us a guided tour explaining what the various plants were for. The owner's wife was preparing pots for seedlings and other customers were wandering around choosing plants. We soon came to a toll road where the prices are so cheap it hardly seems worth collecting it. Then we came to a heritage museum it contains a collection of traditional houses brought here from all over South India. Ikat is a method of dyeing yarn before weaving. This is a collection of household shrines.
Water was collected in the courtyard. We were encouraged to go to the drumming and dance demonstration. Then we continue to look round the collection of houses. This row of terrace houses from Tamil Nadu has been converted into a museum. The bridge leads onto the Keralan section, a part of India heavily dependent on boats. Again, water from the roof is collected in a tank in the courtyard. Moving on, we came to Mamalapuram, which was extremely busy because it was a national holiday. Here we met a group of pilgrims who had travelled overnight by coach to visit the temple complex. As usual, they all wanted to be filmed and crowded round to see the results. The Shaw Temple stands right on the edge of the Bay of Bengal. Surrounded by a row of bowls called Nandis in Tamil. It's a complex of temples and shrines built in 700 AD. It's known as a structural temple because it's built from granite blocks. The alcove in this sculpture was used for ceremonial lamps. On the south side is a very popular beach. A short distance away are the five Rathas, which predate the Shaw Temple by about 70 years. These are not structural temples, but are carved directly from the rock. Holes were cut in the rock and pieces of wood were inserted. These were then soaked with water, causing the rock to split. It was then carved with primitive chisels. Just down the road are cave temples carved into the rock in about the same period. The back walls of these are decorated with relief carvings. Next to these is an immense frieze carved in the 1st century AD. It's 12 metres high and 28 metres long. Round the corner there's a park containing a temple to Ganesh, the elephant-headed god. This family asked us to photograph their daughter. At the side of the amazing balanced rock Children have used the slope as a slide for generations. Uh, 
Thiramurthy Cave is formed by two rocks leaning against each other. On the road outside the park, vendors were selling fruit, drinks and souvenirs to the tourists who'd come from all over India. Indian road rules are the same as ours, but overtaking on the near side is the norm. We stopped at a stall selling coconuts and jackfruit. We had our usual morning drink of coconut water and a lady who was buying jackfruit offered us a taste. The road narrowed but the loads didn't as we headed further south. We caught sight of some salt pans and asked Ashok if we could go in for a closer look. Sea water is pumped into these large pans where it evaporates in the heat. The salt is then raked up and dried to form these large crystals which are put into sacks. They invited us to give them a hand with the bagging up. <laughs> Somehow we ended up paying them for the privilege of doing their work for them. It's amazing what you see on a bike. Eventually we came to Pondicherry. This former French colony, which didn't join the rest of India until the 1960s, has a lovely promenade along the edge of the Bay of Bengal. There's a statue of Gandhi, which has been given a garland for the National Day celebrations. Opposite the statue is the Bharati Park, in the centre of which is the Ayi Mandapam, a monument celebrating the provision of water to the city during the reign of Napoleon III. Nearby is the Made in Pondi craft market. The Church of Our Lady of the Angels was built in 1855 and is the only Catholic church to offer Mass in French, Tamil and English. The town was divided into French and Tamil quarters and the Manakula Vinayaga Temple is the only Hindu temple in the French quarter. The ladies outside were opening lotus flowers to use as temple offerings. It's a Tamil tradition to decorate the street in front of your house and we'll see more of this later. The Sacré-Cœur Basilica is Gothic in style and has some impressive stained glass. We stayed at the Palais de Mahe, a new hotel built in the heritage mansion style, but with a swimming pool where a courtyard would have been. With high ceilings and deep verandas, it has 18 large rooms containing period style furniture typical of the region. After a good night's sleep, we headed out on the country roads to a tiny village to see how the locals live. The travelling tinker bought old cooking pots for a pound a kilo and sold new ones for three pounds a kilo. These little girls followed us everywhere. One family had a little pottery. 
The assistant weighed out the clay for the craftsman to throw into pots. They then put out to dry in front of the house. At the edge of the village is a large banyan tree, close to which another family made lampshades and marbled wrapping paper. This house belongs to a family who'd worked abroad and therefore had lots of money. We walked down the peaceful main street until we came to the community centre. Here the children's paintings lined the walls. This was where we were taught the secrets of decorating doorsteps. Originally these were made using rice flour which fed the ants and kept them out of the house. Nowadays, chalk is used. Now it was Chris's turn. It's not as easy as the teacher made it look. However, once she got her eye in, all too soon it was time to head back to the hotel for the night.